Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is, this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, Lord. We take this time at Christmas time, and we should take it all the time and just stop and let the distractions of this world get away, especially as Barry said, the materialism and everything else, and just be satisfied with daily bread. Realize the grace upon grace upon grace that you have given us through Jesus Christ our Lord, that it is by nothing that we've done whatsoever, so we can humble ourselves before you and stop thinking of ourselves in our own righteousness, Lord, but think of ourselves as humble sinners who come before the cross and accept what Jesus has done by faith and are atoned for that, that our sins are atoned, that we are justified, that we are sanctified, Lord, and that we are your children to live as light in this world. As we read your word, Lord, and study, Lord, help us to contemplate on all that Jesus has done and the empowerment that we have through the Holy Spirit so that we can live a life that brings you glory and honor until he returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the New Testament, there's several words for the word that we translate as gift. We entitle this service the gift. When it comes to salvation, the New Testament writers use still several words. But they emphasize that this gift is something undeserved, something that you can't do anything do except accept it. And if you accept it like Kim said, use it. Realize that you have this gift, that grace has been given to you so you'll be gracious, that you're rich so that you can be rich, that you are loved so therefore you love one another, even your enemies. The first word I want to talk about is Doria. It means a free gift. It stresses the gratitude of the giver, the gratitude of the, the graciousness of the gift that we have so that we understand how wonderful this gift is of salvation. Things that the prophets looked for and longed for and spoke about and everything else that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, would be given for your sins. That He would pay the penalty so that you did not have to pay that penalty anymore. And then He said, I will not orphan you. I will not leave you alone. I will send, have the Father send the Holy Spirit God dwelling inside of you. Wow, the gift that has been given to you. It's something beyond expectation and something that is so, so undeserved. Every New Testament time that the New Testament word is mentioned, it mentions a, or talks about, gives you the meaning of a spiritual gift that we have in Christ Jesus. Not just physical, because we look so many times at just the physical things in this world. It is the gift that Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, if you realize the gift that I am offering you when he offered her water, but her eyes were set on the physical again, when she didn't know that Jesus was offering her living water. In John, first John 14, or in John 14, I'm sorry, Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give and have given you living water. As we read Luke's gospel, you read to the point, and I mentioned that before, that you've got to decide who Jesus is. Not who the crowd say he is, but who you say Jesus is. And if you say that Jesus is your Savior and if he is your Lord, do you live a life that professes that? Are you using that gift or have you put it in the closet and put it on the shelf? Romans 3.23 gives the adverb form of Doria and it was translated freely. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. In verse 24, all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We know that Christ Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us but He died for your and my sins for all eternity, paid the price to set you free and be called a child of God forever and ever and ever. To not have to suffer an eternal death, but instead have the gift of eternal life. 
Another word is charisma. That one might sound a little more familiar to you. It's a gift of grace, charity, because God felt generous to those who did not deserve. He didn't worry about the state of mankind. Jesus didn't worry about being mocked and spit upon or crucified. Oh, it was, it was be troubling him, to say the least, as a human being of the things that he would endure, but even more that he would be separated from the Father because of his love for you. In Romans 5, 15, and 16, but the gift is not like the trespass. For in, if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. And then later in Romans 6, 22 and 23, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit that you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation is a free gift given to share with one another. Are you training up your children? Are you being gracious in the life that you've been given? Are you going out and telling it upon the mountaintops and even in the valley lows that Jesus Christ has come and that He will return again? And that if you believe, if you put your faith and trust in Him, that you can be a child of God, forgiven forever, set free. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. His masterpiece from the beginning of all time for all those who would believe and follow after Him, giving up their life and giving it to the one who gave their life for them. So you should have read Joshua this week. You'll still be reading it next week, and you'll finish up Luke as well. This week you should have read Luke chapter 14 to 17. I'm going to give you the fastest synopsis that I've probably given this year of what we've read. In chapter 14, Jesus, it might be a Christmas miracle. Jesus goes to, goes to a banquet. Then he talks about the great banquet. At the banquet he says, hey, don't take the best seat in the house. There's a great banquet coming up. And there is a cost for following after Jesus. Are you his disciple? Do you believe and will you follow after him? Chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables back to back to back. He is, he is trying to get everyone see, as he's preaching to everyone here, he's telling these parables to everyone, the importance of something lost that could be found. One lost sheep is worth going to find. What shepherd would not go find that sheep? One lost coin is worth finding. Oh, but so many times we focus so much on money and materialism and everything else that we stay rejoicing in it. The point is to rejoice here when something's found, but to rejoice because you can rejoice with others and share your gladness. So we get to the parable of the lost son, or at least that's what it's called, but maybe it could be the parable of the loving, gracious father. And, oh yeah, which son is lost in this story? Where do you fit in? Because that son who in his own righteousness thought he was doing the Father's will and he had plenty of works of righteousness did not enter into the banquet feast. We don't know what happened beyond that. This is the parable that Jesus told. But at the point that the son that squandered all the money and did everything fell on his knees and said, Father, I've sinned against you, he was welcomed back to the feast and there was rejoicing. And the other son stayed out at that moment. You see what Jesus is talking about here? Do you understand about the lost? Are you living your life for yourself? Or are you living your life to tell others about Jesus Christ and this great gift that you have been given? In chapter 16, Jesus stressed the importance of using wisely the riches that we have been given. He even uses an unscrupulous steward who is wise in the way that he deals with the matters of this world so that his eternity would be in a better uh, state. 
He has been given these things to steward until his master returns and celebrates. In verse 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be... Tr who can, whoever can be trusted with very little, which is what we have, can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have been untrust, if you've been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. But wait, the woman rejoiced over her lost coin and everything. Oh yeah, there is rejoicing in the things we have. Don't let them be idols and share what you have graciously with others, especially the gift that you've been given through Jesus Christ. There was a rich man who wound up on the wrong side of the chasm, wasn't it? He thought he would be in a better place. But there's a poor man that was a beggar. Boy, the way we think things are going to wind up may not be there. You know, they say in heaven you'll see the most unlikely people <laughs> and other people you'll look for may not be there. There's so much truth to that. That chapter ends with they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. That's no myth. That's no legend. That's a fact, an empty tomb. The Bible proclaims it. History pro proclaims it. And he went to heaven and he said, don't worry about the times or seasons or the hours or anything that's going to happen. He said, you worry about this. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Has the Holy Spirit come upon you? Is the Holy Spirit telling you and guiding you into all truth to be like Jesus? And are you living your life to love others, to give to them, and to tell them the way? In chapter 17, it starts out this way. Jesus said to his disciples, we've changed the audience here a little bit. It's the ones who say that they believe. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Are you getting the point of what Luke's writing? So the apostles reply in verse 5, increase our faith. Should be a prayer that you say quite often so that you don't get tied down with the things of this world so that you know that you can live a life and if you only have daily bread, you can thank the Lord for it because He's given you daily bread and not a hair on your head will be harmed outside of His will. And that God works all things together for good to those who love the Lord. So are you following after Jesus Christ? Does this gift that God has given you, does it mean everything to you or have you put it on the shelf? Jesus replied and said, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, Prepare my supper? Get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Jesus gave, gave us a mission to go and to train up disciples, to preach the gospel message, to be loving and kind, to bring sight to the blind and hearing to the mute, to right wrongs, to be his hands and feet in this world. So also... When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Ten lepers were healed of a physical disease again. A great gift. And only one of them came back to thank Jesus and to follow Him. To realize the gift they had been given by their body being healed, not their soul having a rest for all eternity. And that man was a Samaritan. You think there's a point here that Luke has to say? That man was a Samaritan. Do you realize the gift of salvation that has been given you? Verse 20, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God, kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
We are the kingdom of God. We are God's children. We are believers. We are children of the Most High, sons and daughters of the King. We can cry out to Jesus as our brother, and we can cry out Abba to the Father because we are family. We have fellowship with one another if you have accepted this free gift of Jesus Christ. So share it. Not only this Christmas season, but all year long. Verse 26, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the Son of Man. There's no condemnation written in here. We know that the world was righteous, or it was wicked, but there was one righteous man with Noah, and that was because of his faith. But this is not what this is saying here. So just in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. There's nothing wrong with those things. Those are great things. Rejoice in them. But don't let it be in what you rejoice in. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Then the flood came and destroyed them all, didn't it? Because they went about their daily lives and didn't care about the coming judgment. We are a day closer to Jesus' return and His judgment and the separating of the sheep from the goats. We don't know when it will happen, so we need to live this hour as if it were our last. This is the day of your salvation. It was the same also in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting... Planting and building, all fine things. But the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day of the Son, the Son of Man is revealed. Did you read that this week? Do you understand it? Do you understand the implications of eternity and the gift of salvation that you've been given in Jesus Christ? And are you using it to change eternity? by preaching and by living so that some that follow after you might believe? Are you writing it on your doorposts? Are you teaching about them when you get up and when you get out? Is there any distractions that need to be taken away so that you are a better living and breathing example of Jesus Christ in the flesh while you have life? Oh, verse 32. It's only three words. Remember Lot's wife. She left that town. She could have been saved, but she looked back longingly at what she left behind. Jesus is clear. He says, no one's fit for the kingdom of heaven if you longingly look back. He gave his everything for you so that you could become a child of God forever, eternally blessed. This is the gift that you've been given. We're going to share in communion, and I love sharing in communion, especially when we have so many children present. I have hand sanitizer out here if you need it. I will sanitize my hands first. I will let you come as you want to come and partake. But I want to remind you of this. Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. He longed to eat that Passover meal. Going back for centuries where we taught our children about the Passover out of Egypt where the firstborn was not killed if they marked their doorpost with the blood. How much more does it mean that your lives have been changed by the blood of Jesus Christ? We're not talking about a physical death, a one-time death. We're talking about Jesus released you from death for all eternity and He gave you life now so that you could have it abundantly, even though you will probably physically die unless you meet Jesus first. And then you'll probably die then in that part. Ooh, that's a different story because you'll probably be so amazed that body will just disintegrate. Who knows? But He sets you free for all eternity by His blood. So we do this in remembrance of Him. So Paul warned us about not taking it in an unworthy manner. That we teach our children. I've watched Cameron come up before and explain everything. That's why I love it so much with our children. Explaining to them what it means to love Jesus because God first loved us. So I will pray over the elements and I'll invite you to come up Take the elements, take them when you want to, and I will close us in prayer. And Logan, I didn't ask you, but I figure you understand to get us some music.